to God, glory to God. Well, I want you to turn in your Bible today to, uh, first of all, to Acts chapter 20 and verse number 28. And the title of my message today is Follow the Leader. Follow the Leader. And so in Acts 28, we're going to leave, read three passages to start with, and then we'll make some other comments and some other scriptures as we go on. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it says, Therefore take, now he's talking to the ministers, and particularly he's talking to the pastors of the church of Ephesus. All of the different congregations, you know, house churches in Ephesus, all of their pastors were there. They said, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd, that is to pastor, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And then turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Hallelujah. Verse number 11. Ephesians 4. I just realized I'm, I'm in Colossians. Let me find Ephesians 4. <laughs> Verse number 11 and verse number 12. And he himself, referring to Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now you notice that he didn't uh, uh, raise up apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers to do all the ministry. He said that he has set apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers in the church to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That doesn't mean that apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers don't have work to do. And we don't have ministry to do. But we don't do all of the ministry. And, and, the, and the, the purpose of these lead ministries is to equip the church to do the work of the ministry. And how to, what, does, what comes from that? The edifying of the body of Christ, the building up, the building up and the making uh, ready of the body of Christ will never be accomplished solely by professional ministry. Amen. It will only come about as the church, people and men and women and teenagers and children sitting in the pew on the benches take their place and work in the ministry to bring together and bring about what God has planned. Amen. So he mentioned these five offices, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Then go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And look at verse number 28. And God has appointed. That word appointed is also in other places translated ordained. God has appointed or, or, or ordained these in the church. First, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, and varieties of tongues. Now, it's interesting, you'll notice that in Ephesians chapter 4, he identifies five of the lead ministries. We call them the five-fold ministry. These are the lead ministries in the church, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and teacher. In Ephesians, he identifies each one of these ministries by name. But here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, he doesn't just identify them by name, he also identifies them by their work. In other words, he gives a description of them. And he does mention the apostle, the prophet, and, uh, and the teacher by name. But what about the other ministry gifts? Well, he, men he mentions, what, what about the evangelist? Well, the evangelist is represented here. He's not mentioned by name, but he's mentioned by his work. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings. Miracles and healings go along with the evangelistic ministry. Remember that the Bible talks about Philip the evangelist? It said that Philip in the 8th chapter of Acts, he went down to Samaria and preached Christ. That's the ministry, that's the message of the evangelist. He's not, unless he's an evangelist and a teacher, and some are, but if he's strictly evangelist, his job is not teaching the church, his evangelist is preaching Jesus. In other words, his job is to get people saved, to call people in. 
And it says that when Philip went down and preached Christ to them, the people gave heed with one accord, seeing the miracles and the healings and the signs and the wonders which were done. Because many that had, had unclean spirits, the devils came out of them. Many who were lame and crippled rose up and walked. So you can see that in the, in the evangelist office, there are miracles and working, working of miracles and gifts of healings. So here when he said, First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles and gifts of healings. He's talking about the evangelists. Then he goes on and says, helps. And helps are a, a ministry in the church. They're not one of the fivefold ministries, but they're a help in the church. Then the word administrations. Now, I personally believe that this is in, in light of other passages in the scripture, that this is a very poor translation of this word in this location. There may be other times in secular uh, writing. It's the only time this word is actually used in the New Testament, this particular word. It's only used here this one time. And so we don't have any other Bible references, but we have, we have the, uh, another word that's very close to it. It's a, it's a form, of just a different form of this word. And it's used two other times, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But in secular writing, outside the Bible, and that, that has weight in, in determining what a word means because you look at how it's used in other places. In secular writing, in Bible times, this, this word did refer to someone who was an administrator. But since we know that the pastoral ministry is the one that is conspicuously missing here, and you think about it, uh, I don't know about you, but if you were, if you were raised in church or most you know, uh, churches, you recognized the professional ministry as being a pastor or an evangelist. I mean, in my denomination, if you went into the ministry and you went in to, uh, to apply for, for ministerial license, you know, you were asked what kind of minister, are you a pastor or are you an evangelist? And those were the only two ministries we really recognized. We didn't recognize apostles. We didn't recognize prophets. We looked down our nose on anybody that, that, that uh, even claimed to be an apostle or a prophet, but they're in the Bible. God set them in the church and he never took them back. But my point is, the two ministries that people are most acquainted with are most readily recognized throughout all that. You do realize that a lot of the church doesn't recognize prophets. But, they're, but it's biblical and they're here. I said in the body of Christ, not today necessarily. I'm just saying in the body of Christ, prophets are among us. Uh, uh, apostles are among us. Teachers obviously are among us. But, but the ministry of the pastor and the evangelist are the two that are most widely known. And of those two, and really of all five considered, the, the, the pastor, rather, is the most widely distributed ministry gift of all of the others. There are more pastors in the body of Christ and always have been from, well, maybe not from the very beginning of the church because all they had was, was, was apostles to begin with. But once the church began to take off and congregations began to be raised up, there were more pastors and there always has been more pastors, always have been more pastors uh, than any of the other individual gifts. And yet it's conspicuously missing from this, from this chapter. Well, it's not. It's found in that word that's translated in the New King James as administrations. But I like the old King James, the older King James, I should say. In that passage, it says that God has said in the church, gifts of healings helps governments. Governments. Uh, so, first of all, we know that this is referring to the pastoral office for three reasons. Number one, we, I've already mentioned, the pastor is conspicuously missing from this list. If, if he's not here, he's not anywhere else, then why would he be left out of this passage? So that's, that's one uh, evidence. The second thing is, we've already read from Acts chapter 20, where Paul called the elders, which are the pastors of the church of Ephesus, and he said, take heed to yourselves uh, uh, and to the flock of God over which the, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God. So pastors are overseers. They're over, what, does an over, what is an overseer and what does he do? He oversees. Amen. 
And uh, so we know that's the role of the pastor. And so that gives support. Again, that's the second reason we would, we would believe that governments refers to the pastor. But then the third thing is in the actual definition of that word and the way its, it's uh, corresponding word is used in other places. The, the word that's translated pastor is kuber, ku, kubernetes. No, that's not it. I knew I would trip up on this. It's, ku, it's kubernetes. Kubernetes. And uh, you, you can detect right away I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm not even an English scholar. So, so uh, I do my best. But, you know, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I can read. Uh, evidently not very well this morning, but kubernetes. And... Uh, in, in various places I've looked at, but in, in, in particular, Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, uh, he says this word is used of steering, like you would steer something. And it also refers to the art of the helmsman, H-E-L-M, man's helmsman. Uh, turn over with me to Acts chapter 27, and we'll see an example of a word that's a derivative, really, of this word, closely associated with it. Acts 27, and look at verse number 11. Now, you know the story here. When Paul was uh, en route to Rome, he gave advice to his captors not to set sail on this last leg of the journey. And uh, they didn't listen to him, and they got themselves in trouble. And, uh, and this is describing how this happened. Paul, in, in uh, verse number uh, 9, it says, Now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. This word helmsman is almost, it's just a couple of letters different, almost the same Greek word. And like I said, they're, they're closely associated. They mean the same thing. That, uh, and it's translated here as helmsman. Well, if you, put, if you take that and put it back in, in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, God has set helmsmen in the church. So that, that it, and then it's translated governments. I really think, I like governments best, but I think governments is, is a little bit harsher than maybe uh, we would come to think. But it is the leadership in the local church to take the helm, the helm of the local church. If you go over to the book of Revelation and look at the 18th chapter of Revelation... Revelation 18 and verse number 17. For in one hour, this is Revelation 18, 17. I'll wait till you turn there. Your page is turning. For in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors and as many as trade on the sea stood at a distance. This word shipmasters is the same word that's translated helmsman, akin to the same word that's translated governments. Shipmaster and all who travel by ship, sailors. Now, Reverend Keith Trump, who is also a, a Greek scholar himself, he said that this word means one who commands the sailors. Well, you know, if you're on a, on a boat, somebody's got to be in command or you're not, or you're not going to get very far. Isn't that right? And in fact... One of the sources I was looking at yesterday, I really never noticed this. One of the sources talked about the fact that the, the helmsman or the person who's steering the ship, it refers to the captain of the ship, but not the owner of the ship. And it said the owner was often on board the ship. Well, we saw that in Acts here where we just read that they didn't give that 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 the helmsman and the owner of the ship discounted what what Jesus said I mean what Paul said isn't that right so that tells us that the that the the pastor isn't the owner of the church he's the captain of the church but the owner of the church church is on board amen he's here glory to God and so as a pastor, with a, 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 a smart pastor always realizes that he's not the owner, that there's somebody else that's over him. 
The pastor serves the Lord Jesus Christ as the, as the head of the church under Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now I want you to go with me to Matthew, the 10th chapter. Matthew chapter 10. Glory to God. Matthew chapter 10. In the 10th chapter, beginning in the first verse, and we're, we're not going to read all of this because we're going to go down to the 40th verse, but I want to set the, the context here. In this chapter, Jesus is sending out his disciples and giving them the, the authority to minister in his name and in his place. And so he's, uh, he sends them out and he names them and so forth. And, uh, he's, and in verse 5 uh, and on, on down, he's giving them instructions about how, where they're to go, who they're to go to, what kind of ministry they're supposed to have, how they're going to conduct themselves, so forth. Uh, he gives them advice about their ministry. And so it, with that in, in mind, in verse number 40, it says, He who receives you, he's still talking to these disciples. He says, He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. Now in Luke's uh, coverage of this same conversation, it's recorded in Luke's gospel as well, the 10th chapter of Luke, he goes on to say, and he who rejects you rejects me. He said, he who receives, going on in verse 41, he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Now, we know he's not just talking about prophets because he didn't send these 12 disciples out as prophets. They went out, first of all, as disciples and they became apostles. But an apostle is one that is sent out. They weren't sent out as prophets. This is talking about people who minister. Whether it's a prophet, uh, whether it's an apostle, whether it's a pastor, whoever it is. He says, receive such minister in the name of that minister. And you shall receive that minister's reward. Now a lot of people, I grew up thinking this. Just if I ever thought about this verse. I don't really recall thinking about it. But I remember when I first got back into fellowship with the Lord. When I would read this. I would think, well, you know, he who receives a prophet will receive whatever reward the prophet has. That's what, if I receive a prophet, I'll get his reward. But after I've, I thought about it a little bit, I thought that would be weird. Why would I receive the reward that God gives a prophet just for receiving here? Well, as I, as I studied it and thought about it, I realized the, ro- the prophet doesn't get a reward for being prophet. Because he, has any, he doesn't have anything to do with it. The gifts and callings of God came, uh, we, were, we were given these gifts, whatever our ministries are, they were given to us in Christ before the foundation of the world, the Bible says. We were always called to this. I don't get a reward for having pastored. I mean, it's the least I can do. i And I can't get away from it. You see that? If I go into the ministry, whatever my ministry is, God doesn't reward me. It's it's required of me. I have to go. The pastor, the evangelist, the apostle, the prophet, they get this reward for obeying, and that is the reward of faithfulness. And you know, even if you're called to something else, If you're called to to serve in a department in the church, if you're called to be in the health ministry, and really everybody is, you'll receive, if you're faithful in that, you'll receive the same reward as as the most notable apostle or prophet that's ever lived. Because again, I I don't get a reward for being a prophet, a, a pastor. I didn't have anything to do with it. I didn't, it wasn't anything that I produced it was something that God produced. So what, does the, what is the prophet's reward? Or what is the pastor's reward? The, the prophet, he was telling 
He, he told his disciples, if you go out and they receive you, they receive me. He said, in my name, cast out devils. In my name, heal the sick and so forth. In other words, the, the, the reward that they had was the ministry that flowed out from them. And Jesus said, if they receive you, they receive me. If they reject you, they reject me. If they receive you, they will receive the reward that flows from you. Well, the pastor's reward is the ministry of the Spirit that flows out from him. But you notice it's contingent, contingent upon receiving him. You have to receive your pastor in order to benefit from his ministry. The, the, the pastor's reward is the benefit and the blessing his ministry brings. So you have to receive him. You're going to have to receive Pastor Greg, Pastor, Pastor Amy, as the pastors that, that God gives you or else you won't really benefit from them. Amen. That means respect and honor the role they are called to play in your life. The pastor is called of God and anointed of God to play a particular role in the life of the church member. We have a calling, we have an anointing, we have been graced and gifted for it and if you don't respect that and honor that, it cuts you off from receiving. Amen. Now, I've noticed this. You know, I've been pastoring for quite a few years. I've noticed this. That there are, there have been, and I suppose always are, and and. I didn't really identify this. It frustrated me for many, many years until I found out what was going on. It seemed to me that people in my church respected me as speaking from God when I'm in the pulpit ministering the Word of God under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. When the anointing was upon me to teach and I'm proclaiming the Word of God, now I'm speaking for God. But as soon as the service is over or, or when service, the next service begins and I'm in the pulpit and I'm saying, you know, we're, we're, we're introducing a new uh, program or, or we, I want you to, you know, to, to, I want you to come to church fellowships. You ever heard me say that? <laughs> church fellowships are important. This, and you know, there are some people in our church that over the years just never would come. I mean, just never, come once or twice and just, you know, would pouted the whole time. They just didn't feel like it was important to be there. So they, don't come to, they just don't come to fellowships. Most people do, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of people that just historically, they're just not their things. They don't come. Yeah, but the pastor said you need to come. But you see, because I didn't quote a verse of Scripture and do an in-depth teaching on it, I just said before I got into the pulpit, before I started preaching, well, because I wasn't under the anointing, a lot of people, well, you know, that's just Brother Edwin. That's just, you know, he's just, that's just pastor talking as a man. But you see, the pastoral anointing isn't the preacher's anointing. The anointing to preach or to teach is, is, is not the same thing as being anointed to pastor. The preaching anointing and the teaching anointing isn't on a man all the time. If it was, he'd just preach all the time. He'd just get up in the morning preaching. He'd just preach all day. Everywhere he'd go, he'd preach. And, and then, you know, he'd preach to his wife, preach to his, well, he did, we do that anyway. But <laughs> preach, preach to the kids, preach to the neighbors, just preach, 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 just take a text and preach all the time. Because that anointing, that's what it's for. Of course, he wouldn't live very long. He'd wear himself out. I mean, you couldn't do that. The pastoral anointing is not the preaching anointing. The pastoral anointing is the anointing to love the flock care for the flock, feed the flock, guide the flock, protect the flock, direct the flock. That is the pastoral anointing. And it's on the pastor all the time because he's the pastor all the time. It doesn't matter if he's on vacation or if he's somewhere else. He's a pastor, first of all. 
And if the call comes, he forgets what he's doing. He leaves that up behind. Well, he might be on. I've left vacation many a time. And come home because there was a situation that, that people needed me. It had to be. And they needed their pastor there. And, uh, you know, as the church grows, other people can do things. I understand that. But the pastor's job is to care for the flock. And it's there all the time. Well, the pastor's role of directing the flock is there all the time. So when people, when people hear the pastor say something that they don't like and that they don't want to obey anyway, like come to a fellowship or something else, serve in the church or be here on Sunday night and come on Monday night and be involved. Don't just sit there, find a job, for, you know, uh, get involved in the ministry. Else, they don't want to hear that. They want their independence. They want their freedom to, you know, they know if they take a job in the church and sign up for something, then they're going to have to be here every Sunday. And they like that even though they might come most Sundays, they always like to have that option. Any given Sunday, I'll just go to the beach. So they won't serve. Or they won't serve in a place that requires too much responsibility. And so when the pastor exhorts that you should take your place and step up and take more responsibility, they want to hear that and say, well, you know, that's just Pastor Greg talking. No, that's Pastor Greg talking. That's not just Pastor Greg talking. That's Pastor Greg talking. Amen. And, and uh, you're not going to receive the ministry. Here's the thing. Pe when people don't receive their pastor as they should, like I've just described, they discount part of it. They take what they want and discount the rest. They really end up cutting themselves off from the full benefit of that that they do receive from him. Why? Because of rebellion. Because of not being scriptural. Because of, of having a wrong heart and a wrong attitude. Even the thing that they want to embrace, they don't get the full benefit from it. Well, it's the truth. You know, what I'm saying isn't theory. Now, now, listen, I, I understand biblical revelation. You, you know, you study the word and all of a sudden something leaps out at you that you hadn't seen before. And immediately, you know, your mind, you start, you start seeing how it lines up with this and that. It just, you know, it connects the dots. You know it's biblical. That's revelation knowledge. You know it's true. It's, it's scriptural. But you haven't necessarily seen it played out. You haven't really seen it. You, you, I know this is what I can have. Or I know this is what God will do because you suddenly see it. That's wonderful. It's another thing to actually see it play out. And so what I'm talking about, that's what I mean by theory. You know, there's some, there's some good theory. It's good when you, when you get revelation. It's still, it's truth to you, but it's a theory in practice because you haven't put it to work yet. Well, what I'm talking about, I've seen, excuse me, I've seen for 43 years. And the people who don't really receive their pastor as such, even when they're enthusiastic and not everybody that shouts amen is getting the same benefit. Even if they're enthusiastically receiving something, they don't walk in the full measure of blessing that even that thing can have. I've, and when I say I've seen that, I've seen it in families. I've seen it in individuals. I mean, I've seen the evidence of it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thess 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 5, praise the Lord, I'm helping you to get more from God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12, and we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Well, who would that be? That would be your pastor. Amen. Amen. Brethren, recognize those who labor among you. The pastor labors among you and he's over you. Quote, now notice, in the Lord. He's not over you in everything in your whole life. He's over you in the things of the Lord. That, not, that doesn't mean that he takes the place of Jesus, but it's talking about in the things of the church, in the things of your involvement in that family of, of believers that God has placed you in. He's over you in that. In the things of the Lord. Amen. And, and he admonishes you. He says, esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. 
and be at peace among yourselves. This word that's translated recognize, uh, it's, it's also translated, and this is, this is some other translations, one said respect. I urge you, brethren, to respect those who labor among you. Another translation says, acknowledge and appreciate. I exhort you, brethren, I urge you to acknowledge and appreciate. Another translation read, I exhort you, brethren, to honor those who are among you. Another translation says, I I urge you, brethren, to give attention to. Well, that's how we're supposed to respond to our pastors. We're supposed to respect them, honor and appreciate them, uh, and give attention to them. Pay attention. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, there's a reason why we're supposed to do this. Why are we supposed to supposed to recognize, respect? Appreciate, honor, and give attention to those who are among, who are over us in the Lord, and to esteem them very highly. Why are we supposed to do this? For their work's sake. Their work's sake. Now, this doesn't mean so, so that they will be able uh, to enjoy their work. It's not what that means. Their work, what, what is their work? Their work is ministering to you. Teaching, feeding, guiding, caring for, loving you, protecting you as a flock and so forth. That's their work. Their, the pastor's work is for you, to benefit you. Well, if you, if you don't honor them and respect them and receive them and all of those things, then their work is hindered. And that doesn't hurt them, it hurts you. Because their work isn't for themselves, it's for you. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now go with me over to the 13th chapter of Hebrews. Hebrews 13. There's another passage here that goes right along with this. Actually, there's two different verses in Hebrews 13. Verse 7 says, remember, I'll let you get there. I hear pages still turning. Hebrews 13, 7. See, if you're on your device, you're still searching, but you can't hear it. (laughs) Hebrews 13, 7. Remember those who rule over you. Well, what does that mean? In the Lord. Doesn't mean they rule over your personal life. Doesn't mean they tell you, you know, where you're supposed to work, what job to take, and tell you who you're supposed to marry, and how you're supposed to conduct your personal affairs. That's, now, the Bible has something to say about our personal affairs. And the pastor does have the right to tell you what the Bible says, but he doesn't have the right to go home with you and make decisions for you. Amen. You're supposed to listen to the Bible and to the word that comes from him and, and act on it. Amen. Remember those who rule over you who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Now, this is talking about your pastor. How do I know this? Why why wouldn't this also be talking about brother so-and-so that you watch on television? You know, your favorite Sunday morning preacher or some other time, you know, that you just really like? I've had people come into my church and right away, they let me know that they're a follower of Brother Doodad on TV. I follow Brother Doodad, and they're basically, they're basically telling me that they're watching me to make, sure if I, to make sure I line up with Brother Doodad. If I don't line up with Brother Doodad, they're out the door, Dad. They're gone. <laughs> and sure enough, they were out the door. I didn't say anything. They just, you know. I, I want to line up with the Bible. Now, I know this is talking about the pastor for this reason. It says, remember those who rule over you. That is, they're over you in the Lord. Well, the traveling minister's not. Apostle so-and-so, evangelist so-and-so's not. 
Now, they have spoken the word of God to you if they're on TV or something. But notice this, whose faith follow considering the outcome of their conduct. There is no way on this planet you can observe the faith, the outcome of a person's faith who's on television. Or by going to their meetings once in a while. Nor the outcome of their conduct. Because if I had to tell it, if, if you know, when we, we're, we're, on, we're on YouTube, you know, we, we have a TV program in that sense. It's not on broadcast, but it's on YouTube. Well, you know, we try to present our best. And, uh, you know, if it's a real terrible service, you know, we just, just might not put that one up. <laughs> Well, you know, the, the traveling minister, you know, he records all of his crusades and he's in nightly crusades and he puts a selection up. Which ones do you think he puts up? The ones when he felt really anointed or the ones he felt like he bombed out? <laughs> puts the, he puts up the ones up that, that he felt like God was really flowing and moving. And, you know, he, 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 the illustrations he gives are usually of his triumphs, his great victories. How he acted on the word, he did this, he believed that, he spoke such and such and believed God and all these great things happened. He doesn't tell you about all the times it didn't come to pass. I said he didn't tell you about all the times it didn't come to pass. So you really can't judge too much and you certainly can't judge his conduct because you don't know what he does when he's not in a pulpit. He doesn't have a church. Come on. He, and there's not, he lives basically anonymously in the community. All I'm saying is the pastor is the only one who really fills this bill because he's here every single week. I mean, he takes a vacation a time, you know, occasionally, but he's here all the time. You can see what works and what doesn't work. You can see his good times and his bad times. You see him when he's really powerfully anointed and sometimes when he can't put two words together. You see his conduct because a pastor lives in the proverbial glass house. He's in the community and, and, and if he's not living right, sooner or later that's going to show up. People are going to see it. Well, thank God for pastors that live among us. Amen. He says, remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their faith. Obey those, verse 17, that's in verse 7. Verse 17 says, obey those who rule over you and be submissive. Notice, for they watch out for your souls. That's the reason you need to be submissive. We're not talking again about being submissive to somebody trying to direct your personal affairs. We're talking about in when he's preaching the word of God and he's speaking the word of God and he's saying, according to the scriptures, you need to be living like this. Submit. Make changes in your life when, when the spirit of God is, is, is ministering this way. Amen? He said... Uh, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. Notice, they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Uh, I, I used to read that this way, that they have to give account for your souls. That the pastor, you know, somehow, you know, he, he's supposed to, to obey them because they watch out for your souls and they're going to have to give account for, for, for what happens to you. That's not true. They give an account of their watching they give account of their ministry, but they don't, I'm, I've never been responsible for how anybody lived other than me. And neither have you. I have had a responsibility all these years to say what needed to be said, to preach what needed to be preached, to not be uh, intimidated, to not back off, but to declare the full counsel of God. And I have to give an account. These pastors will have to give an account for the way they discharge their duties, but they don't give an account for you. <laughs> Amen. Now, it goes on to say, as those who must give account, let them do so with joy and not with grief. 
For that would be unprofitable for you. Not them, you. Now this word grief is an interesting word. It means groanings because of an unappreciated and thankless task. It's exactly what that word grief means in the Greek. I'm going to read that again. I love it. I didn't know this until a few years ago. And then I thought, oh, that's why. That's why I feel that way. Groanings because of an unappreciated and thankless task. Let them give account to the Lord for their work that they've done with joy and not with groanings because the people didn't appreciate it and didn't give any thanks for it. For that would be unprofitable for you. You know, I, I've, there, has, there, have, there have always been people at, 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 at all times, there's been somebody in our church in 43 years. There's never been a time when this hasn't been true. There are people who come to church and they keep, they keep my wife and me sort of at arm's length. You know what I mean by that expression? You know, they're, they're, they, they're open, but only so far. There's a, there's a barrier up. They've got their guard up. Maybe something I've done. Maybe something I've said. Maybe they wanted to serve in a place of ministry, and I didn't think that was the place for them, and, and, I, and I didn't let them serve there. I let them serve somewhere else. Maybe I made a decision that they didn't like. Or maybe they heard something that somebody said, an accusation. Maybe they took somebody else's offense. There's a a lot of different reasons. But I'm telling you, there has never been a time in 43 years that there hasn't been somebody in my congregation that fit this. They've always got me at arm's length. And though they come up and smile, say, Pastor, Pastor, I realize that, that, that they're not fully open. They all, they've always got a question in their mind. And anything I say that hits too close to home, they bow up. He said, that's unprofitable for you. It's, not a, it's never been unprofitable for me. Except for that grief. Ex- except for that, that a pastor knows when people aren't receiving you're not, you're not pulling the wool over the pastor's eyes. I know in the church who receives and who doesn't. I've always known. Every pastor knows. And the thing that causes grief to the pastor is because he knows that person is missing out on something they need. Not, not particularly a, something they preached in a message that they didn't agree with. Not, not just that, but just that distrust. There's, there's, some people have always had a distrust. Sort of a, a second guessing everything. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Always carping, always finding fault with little... Well, I know the tragedy... That that results in in that person. Not because they disobeyed me. Not, that's not it. But because they weren't open to what God wanted to do through me. I've seen it cost them, their families. I've seen it cost so much, lose so much. And the pastor, the pastor, that, that hurts his heart. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. I've got two more scriptures. We'll we'll move to them quickly. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Verse 13 says, For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. He said the the church in Thessalonica, when they heard Paul preach, he said, you didn't just receive this as a man talking to you. You received this as the word of God. Well, when the pastor is preaching the word of God, 
when you reject that, that direction, that counsel from the Word because of some uh, uh, attitude, it hinders your ability. Notice what it says in the rest of this verse. He said, you received it, you welcomed it, not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. It won't work effectively. It won't work effectively. I said it won't work effectively. And we see these things and, it's, and it's, it saddens our hearts. Then finally go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Hallelujah. O Corinthians, verse 11, I'm reading verse 11 through 13. O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now in return for the same, I speak as to children, you also be open. Now that, that translation is the New King James and it's better than the Older King James. The Older King James, you couldn't hardly make heads or tails of what he's talking about. But I like the, the NIV version of this particular uh, three verses the best. It says, We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children, open wide your hearts also. This was as about, as, about as raw an emotional appeal as, as you can find the apostle making in the scriptures. Or anybody for that matter. He's saying, church, I've, I've, I've laid it all bare and that's what a pastor does when he, when, he, when he ministers and when he calls on you and when he counsels you and when he, when he says things that really just warm you and make you excited and want to run around or when he says things that, that, that causes you to be a little chastened and corrected. He's, he, that's not always the easiest thing. Well, let's say this, it's never the easiest thing to do. But he does it because his heart is wide open. And he said, I haven't withholding my affection from you. You've withheld your, yours from me. He said, there, there needs to be a fair exchange. If I give it all, you give it all. If I bear my heart, you bear yours. If I give you all of my affection, you give me all of yours. I speak as unto children, open wide your hearts also. Well, praise the Lord. I, uh, I, I took a lot of these comments out of a good book I read a couple years ago called Building a Strong Local Church. <laughs> and I, I happen to know the author really well. And uh, I thought it would be good to set your, put you in remembrance of these things. Because you're going to have new pastors. And they're going to speak to you the oracles of God. They're not perfect any more than I've ever been perfect or any other minister is perfect. But the calling is legitimate. And the instruction, instruction, instructions of the Lord, which we've read, are, are uh, uh, clear. You can't misunderstand these things. Obey, follow, listen, respect, honor, receive, respond. It's really clear. If you want to receive what God has for you, and He has a lot for you in the, in the years ahead, if you really want to receive, open your hearts. Well, Pastor Greg, you know, he made a decision I didn't like. Well, he, he didn't do that to hurt you. He did it because it wasn't, it wasn't what you wanted, wasn't the right thing. Amen. Just always remember that. And, and give him, just like you have me, grace to make a mistake. I have tried over the years to, to admit it. If I blew it, I just get up and say, you know, I made a, a, a mistake. I blew it. And, uh, and make it right. 
But if you follow a man's life over time, you know, what, what's, what's, what's his track record? What's his track record? Well, Greg and Amy already have a track record here because they have faithfully served under me. They've been faithful. They've been dedicated. They've been respectful. And they've had a heart for you. I've seen their heart over and over and over again. They have a heart for you and for what's best. And they're going to they're gonna step up now in a few weeks. What, two, three weeks, three weeks from now? Prepare your heart now. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, we thank you today for your goodness and for your blessing. We thank you, Father, for your plan. It is unfolding and it will continue to unfold, Father. Glory to God. And we're excited about your plan for this church. Hallelujah. I thank you, Father, for the unity of the spirit that we have. The agreement that we have with one another. And I pray, Lord, that every single member of this church will open their hearts. vast majority have but if there's anybody who is holding back anything in reserve not fully trusting not fully accepting Father that they would open their hearts and let you minister through these pastors to them glory to God we thank you for that in Jesus name Amen